part of the Roja Institute for Construction Science. He's going to do the presentation in English and he's going to talk about the use of biomass ash in the fabrication of self healing engineering cementitium composite. Uh, hello, my name is Sherif Omar. I'm from Malawi. I'm here because I'm doing my master, an international master in advanced materials and innovative recycling. My program is in two, for two years. My first year I did in Spain and in France, and I'm finishing my second year here at Universidad Politecnica of Madrid. <coughs> um, the purpose of by presentation or the purpose of my research, we are trying to find use, we are trying to replace fly ash in making engineered composi composites. Engineered cementitious composites, I'm going to explain them later, but for now I'm going to tell you the objectives of this research. Firstly, we have circular economy because fly ash is coming from coal and if you are going to be using a lot of coal, you're going to we know coal is, is a high emitter. So with biomassage, bio we know that we're going to find a second use for this material. We're going to find a use that's going to give more value to the biomass. The second one is that we know that cement or concrete, they usually break. One of the, the main failures of cement is that they form cracks. And when they form cracks, you have adverse materials coming in. When you have adverse materials coming in, it means that people have, have to lose money to repair these materials. But when you have a material that repairs these cracks, that recovers this crack, that seals this crack, it means that you can have this cement or this concrete or this mortar for a long time. The main objective of this research is that we are trying to see if we can replace the fly, uh, the fly ash, which is found in these engineered cementitious composites, the composites that heal themselves. We are trying to see if we can put biomass ash instead of the fly ash. Replace maybe all of it, maybe part of it, but that's what we are trying to see. And uh, the background is that these cementitious composites I'm talking about, you make them in a way that gives you the ability to have small cracks. We know concrete, the normal concrete, you have big particles inside. You have sometimes uh, steel, you have sometimes different uh, fibers inside. But the main difference between these engineered cementitious composites and the normal composites that you have is that in this material, I'm going to have specially designed microfibers. Usually people are using PVA fibers or PP. The purpose for using this kind of fibers is that they give us better properties. They, they help when you are breaking your material. They can, they can aid in maintaining the structure. The second one, the second difference between this kind of uh, cementitious composites and the composites that we have is that in this composite we use fine sand, we use a high fly ash content, and of course cement as in most mortars. The other one is that in this particular uh, composite, we have a low fiber volume. The low fiber volume, it makes sense when you consider it in two or three ways. Firstly, because I said we are using specially designed microfibers. With these specially designed microfibers, the price is obviously going to be high. So if we are trying to find a material to, to replace an existing material, you can't replace it with something which is expensive. So we try to lower the percentage of the uh, volume fiber. Another thing is that if you have a higher fiber content in your composite, when you are trying to mix it, when you are trying to process the, the, uh, the paste, the mortar, you're going to have mixing issues. So a low fiber volume makes economic sense. This, these fibers, we try to have them inside our sample because it's like I have a composite like this, 
and then the fibers are just running around. These fibers, when you have a crack, you're going, just going to have the compost that is going to break, but the fibers are just going to be connected between. So it's like your material, the, the compost that is broken, but the structure is still standing. So this is what we call an engineered cementitious composite. Uh, when you have a proper combination, when you, when you make your material properly, you're supposed to have this behavior here. Your material, unlike the concretes that we see, your material is not supposed to break when you are loading it. It's supposed to bend. So obviously we know that this is a behavior that we can use in most places. Whether you have an earthquake, it means you can have a material, uh, a house that can bend itself. It means you can apply it in most, most cases. It means you can load it higher than you can load other, other concretes. So, like I said, this material has two properties. First, it has the, the fact that it's, it's ductile, unlike other com uh, composites. It also has a higher capability to self-heal. Uh, what do we mean by this? Normally, we have uh, our, uh, the mortars or the cements, most cement-based uh, materials, they have an ability to heal cracks or to seal cracks after, after they have developed. This is due to the carbonation, hydration, carbonation or hydration of unreacted cement and the uh, pozzolan reactions inside it. You get to make uh, CSH gel inside the, the material, so it heals the cracks. Flyash, when you include it, when you include a high amount of flyash, it means that the flyash has a low, uh, flyash has low kinetics. And what this means is that it will stay longer. Cement will, hydr uh, will have hydr hydration at the beginning, while the fly ash will start, will start its reactions later, which means you have the material covered over a long term. So the, the kinds of self-healing or repair you find in materials is that the first one is the natural. It happens in most materials. If you see a building from 100 years ago, you're going to notice that it's still standing besides it has, uh, having some few cracks. It has been healing itself over time. What we have in our case is this one. We are trying to enhance some of the properties by adding flyers, more flyers, by adding more fibers. This enhances the, this property. How does it enhance it? Because we know that we have, instead of a big crack that you have in the normal concrete, you have a small crack. And this small crack is easy to, to heal. It's easy to cross. Others have been using the activated or repairing. In this case, you know, unlike in these two places where we are using the normal materials you would see in a concrete or a mortar, in this one, you add exotic material. In exotic materials, like you have shape, uh, memory alloys, which once you have a crack, the material will try to, to go back, will try to compress it. You have the, you include some, uh, some capsules which heat up, in this case, you can uh, fasten the hydration processes. Uh, so in our research, we did like I have explained before, we have the cement, the sand, the superprestizer, water, and PVA fibers. These PVA fibers, it's important also the size. The size is important to the design of this material, to be specific. Uh, we maintained these. We, we made it constant in all the experiments that we had. While we had two samples, because this are our work is preliminary, we had a sample A where we put 30% biomassage, because that's our purpose. We're trying to see if biomassage is going to maintain the behavior. So we have a sample B where 70% uh, of the ash is replaced by biomassage. And the reference only uses fly ash, does not use any biomassage. Uh, the sample preparation is the, the normal procedure. We have water mixed with plasticizer to help us with the mixing. <coughs> uh, we have automatically mixed uh, sand, cement, and dash. And then we have the PVA fibers. We, add, we, we first add these materials together. Then we mix them for some, a couple of minutes. And later we add the fibers manually slowly to make sure that they are finally dispersed because dispersion is important in, the, in these materials. We want it to be as uniform as it can be so that the, uh, the properties 
uh, are not dependent on the direction of the, of the sample. Uh, so to test the, the properties of this uh, material that we have, we did flexural tests. This is uh, three-point bending. We use this instrument that we have at, at the, cent uh, the center. <coughs> Each of these composites, we tried, we had two sets. One, we loaded it until fracture, well, another, we did not load. After, after preparation, we had set one of the materials. We divided them into sets. A set one, we, we cure it under the 98% uh, the hum, uh, humidity and 20, uh, 20 de uh, degrees Celsius. We load it and after 28 days of curing. And then we bring it back to the curing chamber then we load it again until fracture. Another one, another set is that we leave it without loading after 28 days, and then we load it after 28 plus 28 days. In this case, we are able to compare these, these two materials. A material that was cracked and then brought back to curing, and a material that was not cracked and uh, that was left in curing until 28 plus 28 days. This is the uh, flexural, flexural uh, test that we did. Another thing is that because we would like to know if we seal the cracks. So to know this, it helps to observe the, uh, the capillary test, the water absorption capability of the sample. In this one also, we had the same, the same idea. We divide them into two sets. We have a set, one set where it's cracked after 28 days of curing you test it. And then you have another set, you wait them to cure in, in 20 plus 20 days, and then you test it, you perform the capillary tests. Another one is that you have a set two, which was not cracked, and then you perform capillary tests at 20, 20 days of curing, and you have other samples also that you had, we had separately. We test them also for capillary, for capillary at 28 plus 20 days. And in order to evaluate the the chemistry, uh, the chemistry, we did the XRD, FTIR, and BET of the raw materials and the, uh, the products. But for now, we're just going to represent the raw materials. And then in terms of the, <coughs> the surface area, we can see the difference. The materials that we have normally are the fly ash and the cement. But we're trying to put in biomass ash. In this case, we can see that the material that we're trying to replace with is smaller compared to these two materials. Obviously, this is going to give us some differences. In terms of water that we can use, in terms of the mechanical properties, in terms of the, in terms of the reactions, we expect to see some differences. Uh, this is the XRD. We can see that we are comparing the biomass ash and the fly, uh, and the fly ash. And the main difference is that the main crystals in biomass ash we have portlandite, cassite, and quartz. Here, portlandite like calcium hydroxide, quartz like silica oxide, whereas cassite was calcium carbonate. So the fly ash we are replacing has ma uh, mainly uh, aluminum and, silic and silica and silica oxide. It means we are replacing two different materials that have two different crystalline phases. So the composition analysis that we did using FRX, we found that in fly ash, we have more silica oxide and aluminum oxide. Here, it's important to note the sulfur trioxide. It's a little bit, it's, it's not much. Whereas when we look at others, another sample of the biomassage, we see a decrease in the silica oxide and also it has lower aluminum oxide. But the most important one is that this material has more chlorine and uh, uh, sulfur trioxide. This, of course, we haven't looked at yet, but we, we intend to see if it has lots of, uh, lots of uh, properties that it adds or reduces. Uh, also, in terms of the water capillary absorption, if you are trying to see that we see, do we seal the cracks after 28 days, 
Did we see the uh, or did we not see the cracks? So what I have here is that a sample that had 70% B was the sample that had 70% biomassage. We see that a sample that was not cracked had less water absorption. It had less cracks. And the one that we had 70%, it had more cracks. It, ha it had a, a much higher water absorption. Whereas the other sample, the sample A, that had a little bit of biomassage, we see that the behaviors can be almost similar. In that case, the reference sample have almost similar water uptake when compared between cracked and uncracked samples. We also have sample B with a higher much, a much higher water capability or water capillary after loading. We also noticed that during the experiment, we noticed that B had actually developed larger cracks because like we said, we have smaller particles inside. Obviously, the, the mechanical behavior is going to be different. So in terms of the re mechanical recovery, this one is expected. This one is our reference. So after 20, 28 plus 28, you have almost similar, should I say the same, mechanical properties. You crack it, you bring it back to curing, you have your material back. Whereas materials A and B, they are showing differences. Minute, but we still have to understand them. When, when we look at A, the uncracked sample has much higher pro uh, mechanical properties than the, than, than the reference, which is a, a positive. Unfortunately, the recovery, the mechanical recovery is low. So we are, losing the, we are losing mechanical properties after cracking. We still have some mechanical properties because it's a material with low cracks. It, it has still has the fiber. So we still have some me uh, mechanical strength. Whereas in, in B, the, the uncracked sample, we observed that it had less <laughs> mechanical strength to the one that was cracked after 28 plus 28 days. We still haven't explained this, so it's part of the work that we're still doing. In conclusion, we, s we feel that it is possible to substitute the fly ash in ECC. In our future work, we want to see the detail uh, of the results, the kinetics, and why are we having more mechanical properties after cracking, after 28 plus 28 days and less, and why are we having A, absorbing more water, uh, why are we having B absorbing more water after being cracked than A? Uh, acknowledgement, we want to acknowledge the funders of our master program, the EIT raw materials, uh, the SESIC, for giving us the chance to do the, the research. We also want to say, uh, to thank the grant of the community of Madrid, with, with, which is the beneficiary of my colleague, Sofia. And also I want to thank the Concrete Institute here, the Laboratory of Concrete at this institute. Thank you.